Hi everybody, I'm Jimmy DeYoung here in Hudson, Florida at the Word of Life Bible Conference Grounds. This is the 30th season for the Bible Conference here at Word of Life. I have been teaching the book of Revelation and I'm doing it chronologically, not numerically. Maybe a different way for you to understand and study Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation. I want you to come join us. We're going inside now to begin the teaching. What I've been teaching uh, for these last couple of days is I'm teaching the book of Revelation. Well, you may say I've already heard the teaching on the book of Revelation. Possibly you've never heard it like I have been teaching it. Most teachers take the book of Revelation and teach it numerically chapters 1 through 22. If you have been taught that way, if you've studied it that way, it's going to be very difficult for you to understand the book of Revelation because of the complexity of how it goes all over the place in those 22 chapters in order to keep the narrative moving forward. Now, there are three chapters in the book of Revelation that do not advance the narrative. That would be chapters 10, 14, and 15. So when you're studying the book of Revelation, remember they're a parenthesis that is bringing new and additional and important information to the table. For example, uh, we looked at the, what we would refer to as the vile or the bowl judgments in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 15, if you study it and look at it, basically it's a temple in the heavenlies and out of that temple comes seven angels. And then there's one who brings up the bowls to put into the hands of the angels and you move then into chapter 16 and that would be the seven bowl judgments or the seven vile judgments. That's chapter 15. It's not real difficult, but it, remember chapter 15 does not advance the narrative. A chapter, uh, chapter 10, for example, is, and don't ask me a question about chapter 10. In chapter 10, you see, I believe it's Michael the archangel who was seen in the first part of chapter 10. Many suggest it might be Jesus Christ. I would not really go to the mat with you trying to defend the fact that I think it's Michael the archangel. Uh, but that's where I come from, Michael the archangel. And he comes along and he has seven thunders. Now don't ask me what are the seven thunders. The Lord, when he gave John the Revelator the seven thunders, what did he say? Shut the book up and don't write about this. So if God didn't give it to John, how in the world am I going to know what the seven thunders are? So we see the seven thunders. We see a little book, a scroll, and John is told to eat the scroll. When it goes in, it is sweet as honey. And when it goes into the digestive system, it becomes very bitter. And that's talking basically about the book of Revelation. God's word is sweet like honey. But when we see the judgment that's also contained in God's word, that becomes bitter in our digestive tract. So that's what that's talking about. Chapter 14 is five different glimpses at what's going to be taking place. I'll show you one of those in a moment. But when you look at chapter 14, it begins with Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives at the side of 144,000 male virgin Jews who have just completed their responsibility to preaching the gospel of the kingdom all across the world. I can explain some of those others. You can ask me about those in the Q&A if you would like to. But those chapters, chapters 10, 14, and 15, do not advance the narrative. They are parenthetical, and you have the opportunity to get more information. By the way, did you notice chapter 15? There's a temple in heaven. Maybe some of you would even ask, what about the Ark of the Covenant? I talked to someone already who wants to know. I think he is going to ask that question, so I'll save the answer uh, for you in the prophecy Q&A period. And I, I hope you'll stay for the Q&A. 
I mean, it's a very informative time. Questions will be asked by someone in the congregation who may have an understanding of Scripture, but they want to know a little bit more about that particular event or that particular passage of Scripture. It'll be a teaching time, so I hope you will stay and join us at that time. Take your Bibles, and now let's go to the book of Revelation and go to chapter 19. Let me rehearse very quickly for you, and especially for those who are here for the very first time. I am teaching the book of Revelation, not numerically, as I said, but chronologically. I have three points as I study the book of Revelation with two sub-points in both the last two sections. Here are my three points for looking at the book of Revelation. The first point would be a prelude to the tribulation. In other words, the prelude, the pianist plays before the activities begin in the service. That is the prelude. So what's happening in chapters 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Revelation would be the prelude to the tribulation period. Now, we get the name for the tribulation period from Jesus Christ himself because in Matthew 24, verse 29, he says, immediately after the tribulation period, I am coming back to the earth, and that's the time he'll set up his kingdom. This microphone stand represents the rapture of the church. It's in chapter 4, verse 1. John said, I heard, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. And immediately, chapter 4, verse 1, he was on earth. Chapter 4, verse 2, he's in the third heaven there in front of the throne of God. So this is chapter 4, verse 1, the rapture of the church. And in essence, that is the period of time that is going to be on display between that mic stand back there and this mic stand over here. This is a seven-year period of time. 1260 days in the first half, 1260 days in the last half of this tribulation period. That's three and a half years. You'll see in the book of Revelation, time, singular, times, plural, and half a time. So you'll have three and a half years over in that first half, also in the second half. You'll see this that is developing, giving us an understanding of how long it's going to be. I made a statement yesterday. I thought maybe I could uh, answer the question before you might ask it. How, I thought the Bible in Matthew 24 said nobody knows the time, the day or the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's talking about not the rapture of the church, but the second coming in Matthew 24. And when you add 1,260 days and 1,260 days, that's a seven-year period of time. And Jesus said immediately after the time, seven years, the tribulation period, I'm coming back. So you can determine that. But if you go back and look at those passages, you need to understand what uh, the Greek words for day might mean. Is it a 24-hour day they're talking about? But in addition to that, you go through chapter 24 and you'll see the ones who will not understand the time when he is coming back to the earth are the lost people or people living totally in sin. He makes that very clear in the Olivet Discourse. And in fact, Jesus Christ, he, when he came to the earth the first time, fulfilled the first four of the seven Jewish feasts that are found in Leviticus chapter 23. Number one, he was crucified on Passover. And in the proper day sequences, he was put in the grave on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits in the proper day sequences. And then 50 days later on the Feast of Pentecost, as he had promised, the Holy Spirit came and established the church. Do you understand now? Jesus fulfilled the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and the Feast of Pentecost. Those are the first four of the seven feasts happening in the spring. To be consistent with a hermeneutic, the science of interpreting Scripture, Jesus Christ on the proper day sequences is going to have to be able to fulfill the last three, the fall feast. The first one was on the first day of the seventh month, and that was the Feast of the New Year. They also call it Rosh Hashanah, which means the new year, but they also title it the Feast of Trumpets. If you look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31, you'll see that when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, what does he say to the angel beside him? He says, blow a trumpet, 
blow a trumpet and call a solemn assembly and bring all, all the Jews from all over the four corners of the earth, all the Jews from the heavenlies back to the earth. That's the trumpet sound. The Feast of Trumpets is the day that Jesus Christ comes back. After the Feast of Trumpets, there's a 10-day period of time. They're called the 10 Awesome Days. That's the time when the Jews are trying to be included in the Book of Life. And on the 10th day of the seventh month, you have what they refer to as the Feast of Yom Kippur. Now, I said feast. It's probably better stated as a fast. It's a fast day, a 25-hour fast day. They do it for 25 hours to make sure they get in 24 hours. And on that day, Jesus Christ, and I'll show you how this is all going to unfold in a moment, will be coming back from Petra, and he'll travel across the Jordan Valley, come up on the backside of the Mount of Olives, go around to the Eastern Gate, walk in the Eastern Gate, walk up to the temple that he has built a couple of weeks earlier, and there at that point in time, he walks into the Holy of Holy and he gets his position as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that is on the Feast of Yom Kippur. Now to be consistent, and you have to be consistent in the Word of God, if you're going to study it and understand it correctly, five days after that, the 15th day of the seventh month in the Jewish year, on that day begins the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's the time when we see the Jewish people celebrating and looking forward to the kingdom period. And that's exactly as what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns back to the earth. Now, so that is at the end of the seven-year period of time. I taught you yesterday the last event to take place before Jesus Christ comes back is going to be the destruction of Babylon. In Revelation chapter 18, the word Babylon is used three times. The word city is used six times. The word great is used eight times. It's the great city of Babylon, and that's going to be the international headquarters for an economical, political, governmental system. And Antichrist, after the abomination of desolations, comes over to what is in, revealed to us in Revelation 18, this great city, and it's going to be destroyed. Chapter 18, verses 10, 17, and 19, in one hour. Chapter 16, starting in verse 17, it lays out how that's going to happen. The greatest earthquake that ever hit the face of the earth is going to take place, dividing the city. And then the Lord's going to allow hailstones weighing about 75 pounds apiece to fall on the city of Babylon. Now, I'm giving this information to you, and if you hear me talking, for example, about Babylon, we're talking about modern-day Iraq. Babylon, literal Babylon, is on the shores of the Euphrates River, 58 miles out of downtown Baghdad. That's where the Antichrist is going to be operating from. The last thing to happen before Jesus Christ comes back would be the destruction of Babylon, and then Jesus will step back on the Mount of Olives. I'm going to go through that with you with the Scripture in a moment, but for those who weren't here for the last couple of days, and for rehearsing it to you again because repetition is the best way to learn, let me lay out for you chronologically how these seven years, they're found in 16 chapters, verse chapter 4 through chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, See, this is the prelude to the tribulation. Then our second point is the program of the tribulation. Very first thing happens, remember, after chapter 4, verse 1, we go to chapter 19, verses 7, 8, and 9. That's the marriage and the marriage celebration or the marriage supper of the Lamb. Prior to that, we have the judgment seat of Christ to receive our wedding garment to be married to Jesus Christ, and in the heavenlies we'll be celebrating that marriage for a seven-year period of time, which is very similar to the Jewish operation for a marriage. After the wedding ceremony is taking place, after the marriage has been consummated, then they celebrate for a seven-day period of time applicable for the end-time period. Then we see three layers that will unfold simultaneously in that first three and a half years. The first layer back here would be chapter 17, and that's the false church that's located in Rome, Italy. 
And then the next layer is going to be two witnesses that will be preaching for a 1260-day period of time from the Mount of Olives in the city of Jerusalem. That would be Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and following. And then the front layer out here, three layers, three events happening, unfolding simultaneously in the first three and a half years, would be the seven seal judgments. That's chapter 6 and also chapter 8, verse 1. And so you have the backdrop, the false church, Revelation 17, and then the two witnesses preaching in that first three and a half year period of time for a 1260 day period of time. 144,000 male virgin Jews come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. That's chapter 7, verses 4 to 8. And chapter 7, verse 9 talks about a multitude that actually nobody could number that come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because those 144,000 male virgin Jews go across the world for the entire seven-year period of time endeavoring to win everybody to Jesus Christ. They will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14, and then the end will come. And then that first frontal a line of activities happening simultaneously would be the seven seal judgments. The first one on a white horse would be the Antichrist. On the red horse would be the battle, a Gog Magog battle. And that is a battle that basically is made up of the Islamic world led by Russia. That's Ezekiel chapter 38. That's also the book of Psalm chapter 83 and the book of Daniel chapter 11. By the way, chapter 11 of Daniel, verse 40, says the king of the north, and when you study the scriptures, the king of the north is modern-day Syria. And what's so key about this, Syria makes the first move to go after the Jewish state and wipe them off the face of the earth. Syria has desired to do that for a number of years. In the Six-Day War in 1967, Hafez al-Assad, who was the president of Syria, he lost the Golan Heights. The Israeli Defense Force went into the Golan Heights, drove the Syrians out. They were there in the Golan Heights overlooking Tiberias and the Sea of Galilee. They had control of the northern part of Israel. But the Israeli Defense Force in a six-day war drove them out and established their residency in the Golan Heights, which was actually, if you read the book of Joshua, chapter, I think it's 18, that God gave the Golan Heights, it's called Bashan in Scripture. The word Golan is also used six times in Scripture. That is the Golan Heights. And it was 3,500 years ago that the Lord gave the Golan Heights to the Jewish people. That should answer every question. It has not. There's still debate. There's still fighting going on. And Bashar Assad, the president of Syria, said not too long ago, I'm going to take the Golan Heights back in honor of my father. I'll either do it diplomatically or I'll do it militarily. And so that sets up the scene that we're watching right now unfold. We're living in this time. We're on the sidelines. We're watching the battlefield, and it's preparing to accomplish and fulfill Bible prophecy even as we live in this day. And so that's the second seal. That's the war. And that's at the beginning. The Battle of Armageddon happens over at the end. We'll look into that in just a moment. But that happens at the end of the tribulation period. So get your wars right. This is the Gog Magog War. And over there, just before, at the time of Jesus Christ's return, that is the war, of the Battle of Armageddon. I really refer to it as the Campaign of Armageddon. That's a better terminology because the Bible tells us over in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2, all the nations of the world are going to be gathered at Jerusalem. Now the battlefield is the Jezreel Valley, 97 miles north of Jerusalem. But all of the nations of the world will gather at Jerusalem. So make sure you have your wars right. Here's the Gog, Magog War, and that's the campaign of Armageddon. And so all of these happenings are in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Chapter 12, starting in verse 7. May I tell you I'm noticing something? Not too many of you are taking notes. You people must have photographic memory. I mean, if you can sit here and listen as fast as I'm going 
and get that in your mind and have it down, that is amazing to me. I don't know about you, but at my age, I'm having some problems. You notice I have to have my glasses up here so I can even see the Bible. And I have to maybe sometimes hold the Bible a little farther away so I can see it better. And when you're talking to me, you'll notice I'm watching your lips. I have to read your lips to hear what you're saying. So I have a problem with my sight, my hearing. I've got another problem, but I can't remember what it is now. But uh, <clears throat> get my point? So unless you're going to, man, we're going to have about 500 people buy my tapes over there, I guess, so you can hear them again. Uh, take notes because this is explaining the book of Revelation to you. And as events are happening in this world, you can put them on this timeline through the end times. So over here in chapter 12, starting in verse 7 through verse 17, it's going to be a battle in the heavenlies. Michael the archangel, who's commander-in-chief of the good angels in the heavenlies, and Satan, that old demon himself, Satan is going to command the evil angels, and they're going to have a battle. And at that point in time, this is at the midway point of the tribulation, just prior to the abomination of desolation, at that point in time, all evil angels are thrown out of heaven, never to enter there again. What do they do in the next three and a half years? They do everything to kill every Jew that they possibly can. What do the people in the heavenly say? Oh, praise the Lord! The evil angels have been thrown out of the heavens. You know that Satan himself goes into the third heaven, stands before God the Father on a daily basis? On a daily basis. That's chapter 12 and verse 10. To accuse, to accuse each and every one of us. That's why Jesus Christ is not on the throne today because he's our advocate against the adversary. And why is Satan going to try with all of his evil angels to kill the Jews? Because God has made four promises to them. The Abrahamic covenant, uh, chapter 15 of the book of Genesis, you're going to be a nation forever. The land covenant, Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm going to give you a piece of real estate ten times what you have today. The Davidic covenant, I'm going to give you the city of Jerusalem. And King David, you're going to be resurrected to be co regent with Jesus Christ in that temple forever, and the kingdom that is set up headquartered in Jerusalem forever. You'll be King David, the co-regent. Jesus, book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, said, I will resurrect David to be the co-regent. He'll be the prince. I'll be the king. Right there in the scriptures. And this is all we see in this timeline through Revelation, which is revealed to us chronologically. And so then you have one more covenant, the new covenant. The new covenant is for the Jewish people. Read it, Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, I give the new covenant to Israel and Judah. Those are the two parts of the Jewish 12 nation, nation that God has promised to give the Jewish people. So that's at the midway point of the tribulation. When we come to this particular lecturing, we're talking about the abomination of desolation. Now listen to this verse. You don't have to return to it. I would write it down. It's Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice to cease. That is Daniel 9, 27. The he is the Antichrist. The one week is the seven-year tribulation period. The sacrificial system will be reinstituted when this temple is built and stands on the Temple Mount at the midway point of the tribulation. After destroying that false church, chapter 17, the back layer of these three layers of simultaneous events that unfold, after he destroys that city of Rome and the false church that's located there, that would be chapter 17, verse 16, the Antichrist then leaves and he goes over to Jerusalem. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says he walks into the temple, he goes into the Holy of Holies, and he claims to be God. Now, that's what he told everybody he would do over there in Isaiah chapter 14. I will be worshipped in Jerusalem. And as he goes into the temple claiming to be God, that's the abomination of desolation. Jesus confirmed that if you don't want to believe what I have to say. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee, head to the mountains. And that's when they run up to Petra, 
that place prepared by God to protect the Jewish people. This is the midway point of the tribulation. The last 1260 days or three and a half years is going to unfold with number one, the trumpet judgments. That's chapters 8, 9, and 11 of the book of Revelation. Number two, the vile judgments. That would be chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. And you see those woe judgments there found in chapter 9? The fifth trumpet judgment is the first woe. The sixth trumpet judgment is the second woe. And the first vile judgment is the third woe. And because of that, out of that seventh trumpet judgment come the seventh. Oh, remember chapter 10? The temple in the heavenly, seven angels walk out, they receive the vials, they then come to the earth to unfurl all of those judgments. The last one being the destruction of Babylon. You see, as you study chronologically, I was going all over the book of Revelation. I wasn't going numerically. I gave you the chapters, and you can study it numerically. I have my commentary on the book of Revelation back there. I do the exact same thing, so if you miss the notes, you can buy the notes back there, and uh, you'll be able to have an unfolding chronologically of the book of Revelation. Now, with that Babylonian empire, an economic, political, governmental power headed up by Antichrist, on, and it's literal Babylon on the shores of the Euphrates River, when that's destroyed, we then are going to see how the end times and the return of Jesus Christ will take place. Go to chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 19, and look at verse 11. Chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he had sat upon him, called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, you recognize the description as Jesus Christ who gets on his white horse in the heavenlies. Look here in verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, we can recognize who that is because of what they're wearing. Notice what they're clothed in, in a, the Bible says they followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Look over here in verse 8. This is the wedding garments that we received to be married to Jesus Christ at the beginning, just prior to the clock being opened up and starting to tick on the tribulation period. Verse 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So those people, at that army in chapter four, uh, verse 14 of chapter 19 would be the church. We still have our wedding garments on. By the way, look here in verse 16. And he, this is referring to Jesus Christ, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the very first time that that title is given to Jesus Christ. He's on a white horse. He's coming back to the earth. He's going to receive the kingdom from God the Father. That's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where God the Father, the Ancient of Days, it referred to there in that passage, the Ancient of Days will give his dominion, his kingdom to the Son of Man. That's the name for Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When I see him coming in the clouds with great power and great glory. You know what's so interesting about that statement in Daniel? That's what Jesus said. He said, when you see me coming in the clouds with great power and great glory, I'm ready to receive my kingdom. Now, when does that happen? Over here at the return of Jesus Christ. Over here, we're living in the church age. We're approaching the rapture of the church. He is not king of kings and lord of lords. He gets that title when he's mounted to that white horse and is coming back to the earth on his vesture, on his thigh. He gets that title, king of kings and lord of lords. What's his title today? 1 John chapter 2, he's our advocate. He's our attorney. He stands there at the throne of God. And when old Satan's city face comes up to accuse us for sinning, which all of us will do according to 1 John, there's Jesus. Yes, Lord, 
I died for all Jimmy the Young sins, past, present, and future. He's, our, he's got a responsibility. He's not king of kings. He never gets that title in the heavens. Have you not quoted ever the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Not only does Jesus Christ get his crown coming to the earth, and not only is his title King of kings and Lord of lords, it's on the earth his kingdom is going to be. Because the third heaven, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, is going to be totally destroyed. It's going to be totally destroyed. And so he in the third heaven will not have a title or a leadership role. He's serving the Father. He's advocating for you and for me. I like that position he's in today. I need that position and I'm ready when he calls me up to be with him to go into another relationship with him. But I love the relationship that is now in place. And so we have the seven trumpet judgments, the seven vile judgments, the last of the 21 judgments in the book of Revelation, chapters 4 to 16, uh, chapters 4 to 19, 16 chapters would be the destruction of the city of Babylon. Now he mounts the white horse here. We that are in the heavenly still wearing our wedding garments are going to get on white horses and we're going to come back to the earth. Look here in verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all the men. This is talking about the birds in the sky, both free and bound, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now, what is going on? Why is it that when Jesus Christ comes back to Jerusalem, he's going to be met with half of the earth's population of today? Only half, because one half would have already died. Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet, chapter 16, verses 13 to 16, will use signs, wonders, and miracles. We have been so duped. Listen to me. The body of Christ has been so duped by watching so-called Christian television, we think miracles are all of God. Chapter 16 of the book of Revelation says, they're like evil frogs, and out of their mouths come signs, wonders, and miracles. You must have God's word direct you in all information you see or hear or are taught. Have your Bible. That's the absolute. Don't check me out. Check all prophecy teachers out with the word of God. And so all the nations of the world alive, that would be all those in the far east, because the rest of the other half of the world's been killed. That was in the... Uh, the fourth seal judgment and the sixth trumpet judgment. There were a fourth killed in the seal judgments, a third killed in the trumpet judgment. That leaves half the population, and half the population is on the other side of the Euphrates River, which is a natural border, and across there is the far east, and the kings of the east come in. They're the ones that go to Jerusalem. They're gathered there. Jesus Christ comes back. When he steps back on the Mount of Olives, the Bible tells us in chapter 14 of Zechariah, verse 4, he comes back and the mountain splits. You know what the text says? Jot that down to look up later. The text in Zechariah 14 and verse 4 and verse 5 says the mountain splits, making way for those gathered to go against Jesus Christ to go to the valley of the mountains. The valley of the mountains. You know what the valley of the mountain is? The Jezreel Valley. If you've never been to Jezreel, you've got to go to Israel to learn the geography. It's so important in your study of Bible prophecy. The Jezreel Valley, if you're standing at Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley, over here is Mount Carmel. 
up to the north, the mountains of Nazareth. To the south, the mountains of Samaria. Out to the east, you see Mount Tabor, Mount Moray, Mount Gilboa. It's a valley 67 miles long, 14 miles wide, 1,000 square miles in the valley of Jezreel. And so they start to go against Jesus there in Jerusalem. That's why it's the campaign. They move 97 miles north up through the middle part of the state to the Jezreel Valley. What does Jesus do when he gets there? The Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Zechariah, chapter 6, verse 12, that he's going to build a temple. You see, that temple, that false temple for a false messiah, the Antichrist, the one at the abomination of desolation, when the Mount of Olives splits, so does the Temple Mount. It destroys that temple. When Jesus comes back, he refurbishes the city of Jerusalem. It's uh, about... 8,000 square feet, uh, miles right now, it's going to be 25,000 square miles. He's going to lift it up. Then the Temple Mount itself, one square mile, then he builds a temple on top of that. Book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 46, 202 verses of detailed information about that temple. And so he's spending time building the temple. That's why he's still in Jerusalem. And once that is done, he's going to head up to the Jezreel Valley. When he gets up to the Jezreel Valley, the Bible tells us, like a sword proceeding out of his mouth, he's basically going to cast everybody dead. This is not going to be an atomic battle. We're going to be with him because after the rapture, we never leave his presence. But the point is, we're not going to do anything. Jesus is going to handle the whole thing. He's going to say one word, probably, die they'll die and the blood will flow out of their bodies of the people of the horses look over here in chapter 14 just a second remember I told you chapter 14 is a parenthetical passage of scripture does not move the narrative forward look at verses 19 and 20 chapter 14 and the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth and he gathered the vine of the earth and he cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came up out of the wine press even unto the horse's bridle by the uh, space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. You know, a thousand six hundred furlongs reduced to feet are miles, let me say, 176 miles. 176 miles. You see what the text says? Blood's going to flow as high as the horse's bridle. Well, let's think about that. Is that real? Wait a minute. You have the armies of the world gathering there in Jerusalem. How many people you think might be there? I can tell you this, Russia, I'm sorry, China has an active army of about 4, 000, 4 million people, 4 million people. But you know how large their militia is? 200 million. Those are men have served in the military and are able to be called up for whatever. Now you just put China, 1.4 or 5 billion people, India, 1.6 billion people. How many of those people would be their military? May I just, if they have 200 million there in China, and by the way, that number 200 million quoted in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. Let me just be very conservative and say a hundred million. And so the army that comes in to take on Jesus would have personnel numbering a hundred million. Now each of those men would have six quarts of blood in his body. And so when the blood flows out of their body, that's six hundred million quarts of blood. Oh, do the arithmetic on it. I did it on the John Ankerberg, and they said, look, you're too conservative, D. Young, but let me tell you what I came up with. 600 million quarts of blood would be about 50 quarts each for every foot for 176 miles. 50 quarts, of, about the height of a horse's bridle. Word of God. 
absolute glory to God. And this is what's going to unfold. Where do they go? Well, Jesus Christ, after that battle, goes over to Petra. Go to the book of Isaiah. Book of Isaiah and go there to chapter 63. Remember chapter 61 in the book of Isaiah? That's when Jesus was there in Nazareth. He went into the synagogue. He read the scripture that day. Here's what he said. Look at chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is Jesus speaking. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the scroll. He quit reading right there. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He left out, and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Wow. Go over to verse 1 of chapter 63. And Isaiah asked two rhetorical questions. And Jesus answered. Here's the first question Isaiah asked. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I'll give you the answer in a moment. You know where Edom is? Lower third of modern day Jordan. You know where Basra is? Entrance to the unbelievable seventh wonder of the world, Petra, the place prepared by God to protect the Jewish people in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so Jesus walks over there. Who is he that's coming with his glorious apparel? Well, the answer is there in verse 1. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Here's the second rhetorical question. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like unto him that treadeth in the wine vat? What's he been doing? Walking through the valley of blood. Jesus answered, verse 3, I that trodden the winepress alone and of the people that were none with me, for I will tread them in my anger and I will trample them. Wow. Now notice verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeem is come. Finishing Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2. This is Jesus Christ. May I tell you, from the ghetto to the entrance of Petra, 176 miles where the blood flows as high as the horse's bridle. He gathers those Jewish people. There's only one-third of the Jews left. Zechariah 13, 8 says, during this terrible time of tribulation, two out of every three Jews will be killed. And then in verse 9 it says, and those other third will come to know me as Lord and Savior. Jesus then gathers them in Petra, he crosses the valley, the Jordan Valley, coming up the backside of the Mount of Olives. Ezekiel chapter 43, quickly. Ezekiel 43, verse 1. And afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, the eastern gate. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, Petra. And his voice was like the noise of many waters, Revelation chapter 1, his person. And the earth shined with his glory, verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the house of the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me, verse 7, and he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. He comes back. The battle of Armageddon follows his building of his temple. Ezekiel 40 to 46, 202 verses. 
He goes up to the Jezreel Valley. He wipes out all of those armies gathered to destroy him. He walks 176 miles over to Petra. He gathers one-third of the Jews that would be left. That's somewhere in, in the area. There's about 14 million. That's about 4 million Jews left. He comes across the valley, Jez Jordan Valley, up the backside of the Mount of Olives, into the temple complex, through the eastern gate, into the Holy of Holies, sets down to be king of kings. Because at that time, God has given him his kingdom. I want to tell you, that kingdom is unbelievable. That kingdom, you will be amazed what's going to, how we're going to, let me tell you something about the kingdom. Take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm out of time. I'm not going to be able to teach you about the kingdom this morning. Really very sorry about that. <laughs> but if you come back tomorrow morning, I give you all the information about the kingdom. Not only the kingdom. Do you know the kingdom is only the front porch for eternity future? Do you get that? The kingdom period of a thousand years in the post Lude to the tribulation. That third part of studying Revelation, it's only the front porch for eternity future. What we have, what a study it's going to be tomorrow morning. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this awesome, amazing, articulate book. You've given it to us with a purpose. The first purpose would be to study it. You want us to study to show ourselves to prove workmen worthy of you. Uh, there's no question that that's not an option. We simply must study the Word of God, and in particular, the prophetic Word of God, because that lays out for us all that we need to know about the end times. If we're going to make decisions, That'll affect tomorrow. We better know today what's going to happen tomorrow. So thank you for having enough confidence in us to give us this. Now help us to study. I know you're going to do it. The Holy Spirit came to teach us things to come. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for these precious people here eager to learn. In my precious name, amen.